Hi everyone. Let's now uh, have a look at uh, this section where we talk about the frameworks, objective, and the underlying assumptions. While in the introductory section, you know, we talked about these, uh, the, the reason why, for example, we need a framework and uh, the underlying assumptions we talked about, of course, uh, the accrual as well as the going concern assumption. We just want to go a little more detailed, right, around these aspects. So when I look at the, the conceptual framework, the, the the broader idea is to have a clarification on you know what are those 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 fundamental aspects what are the what is the foundation of building the uh, the financial statements what are the foundation that we need to kind of have to prepare or present the financial statements right it also talks about the objective of general purpose financial statements uh bear it in mind that is specifically covered under in ds one which is presentation of financial statements right it also talks about the qualitative attributes, including, for example, relevance and faithful representations. We'll be discussing that as well. The underlying assumptions of financial statements, we have talked about it a couple of times already. Uh, it discusses the elements of financial statements. What I, what, I, what I need to really be knowing as an accountant at any point in time, right? Especially when you qualify after becoming a chartered accountant, right? You would be you know, required many a times to be uh, assessing, asking yourself whether something is an asset or not, right? It appears very easy for us sometimes, right? But in reality, it can be really a question of argument, especially especially in the in the complex areas that we would be discussing, uh, you know, over the over the course of the uh, over the over the course of time, you know, when you look at the areas like financial instruments, you look at the business combinations, etc. It could be really typical to understand, you know, what could be, for example. Uh, a liability or an asset or an equity, even even talking about the basic elements of let's say you know incomes and expenses, how are they, how they should be read, how they should be understood, and and when should they be recognized, right? So the recognition criteria is also discussed, and then the measurement part of it along with the concept of the capital, something that we talked of course in the introductory framework. Of course, the purpose of course is to help the development of future NDAs and whatever are your existing NDAs, right? They also need to be reviewed, right? Just, just imagine, you know, a company is using an NDAs, right? And, and it, is, it is facing some practical challenges in the application thereof, right? So how do you, how do you really ensure that the company is able to, for example, you know, uh, get the right understanding? As we said, it's a principle-based framework. It's a principle-based standards that we've got on rain days, right? So how do you really apply that? So the framework is the foundation to support that part, right? If there's a, the challenge that you're facing, you really go back to the framework, try to understand the different, uh, you know, measurement criteria, or let's say the elements of the financial statements and you, and you come to, or you attempt to come to a conclusion, right? So in a way, the framework is a guideline. Okay, similarly, the framework can also be used to establish the future in days, right? So, for example, in today's time, we can say that there's a there's a standard on insurance which is which is which is due. So, so there is an expectation that it should be coming in a couple of years from now. So, so, so you start talking about if I'm if I'm looking at a complex industry like insurance, then how should I look at each and every element within that sector? So, the framework would support. So, framework is the guiding force of that. Okay, and since there's a there's a common framework around, it helps promotion of, you know, harmonization of regulations, accounting standards, and the procedures relating to the presentation. Right? It gives a it's a clear guideline in terms of how you should be treating the elements, how should you be accounting for presenting those elements in the financial statements. Right? It does not end there. Of course, even auditors would be required to look upon whether whether they are getting uh, you know the, the right understanding of how the how the financial statements are let's say prepared by the client are they in lines with the index and and they develop their understanding you know while forming formulating an opinion about the financial statements of their clients so auditors look at the framework in detail you know a lot of lot of complex areas where the framework becomes a guide and that's something which is the expectation as well and finally it assists preparers and users to interpret those issues which are not covered by the standards. As we said time and again, Indias are principle-based accounting standards. They are not a volume of text that you keep on reading and try to guide you know, get an answer on that. They are they are prone to 
subjectivity so so the basis of concluding whether whether something can you know confirms with the with the requirement of india is you need to have some concept around it the so framework builds that idea so you need to really go back to the the framework at each point in time right we'll see why probably are we discussing that at length so many times right uses of financial statements you can name those and that's what the list is all about it could be a customer it could be government it could be the providers of finance like a banking institution or or somebody who has let's say you know invested in a company's debentures for example it could be a it could be government it could be employees it could be shareholders right so there are there are multiple uh, you know users of financial statements and each of such user each such user has its own its own expectation right they look at their areas of interest right so somewhere somewhere the framework helps them you know read and interpret in in the right context in terms of what these financial statements are trying to do or trying to say okay now it would be it would be unwise to to think it would not be logical to think that somebody who's not an accountant but but let's say is willing to buy a share in a company right maybe maybe a, maybe a doctor you know maybe an engineer right somebody who comes from 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 a, a non commerce background for example so so are they also you know able to understand these financial statements and is the framework helping them the answer is a clear no right the framework does not expect to go in detail to teach you accounting right the framework does not go in detail to talk about why this disclosure is done right it is expected that those users have an understanding of let's say accounting already right you're not you're not teaching them how to learn accounting you're teaching them how to read financial statements right so do you expect them to be knowing the basics of the business the risks associated with the business etc already okay so if you don't know that the framework would not take a responsibility but of course the idea of the framework is to build that clarity in terms of how they should be of course interpreted right so when i say i'm looking at you know the uh, the financial statement being prepared the framework takes care of it that all that information that you are sharing about the company's performance the position the cash flows etc right and that's where you look at the balance sheet you talk about statement of profit or loss we talk about statement of cash flows there is also a concept of statement of changes in equity we'll see when we do in ds1 so it also quote there's the disclosures of course these are all the set of information right which is required right so it provides that information so that the users can take economic decisions right users can understand and and they can decide about their investment decisions should it be should should they continue to you know stay invested in the company should they rather even think of investing more or should they should they simply exit right so 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 the framework becomes a guiding force in that sense right so the users would be able to understand and 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 take an economic decision about their investments including understanding of how is the management operating right and also what is that which is which is lying in future so that's something which is uh, a precise but a very very relevant objective of preparation of financial statements okay underlying assumptions i don't want to spend a lot of time talking about it fundamentally we look at accrual basis has to be followed and the assumption of a going concern that right, is something which you would expect an entity to follow at any point in time right accrual basis we have we have practically understood accounting from the starting only talking about accrual basis right so other than cash flows we are simply saying that the financial statements be it a balance sheet be it a statement of profit or loss statement which is in equity and and the disclosures that down that they should also be considered they should all be considered using of course the accrual basis of accounting right that's something which is there going concern we assume very clearly that the entity is expected to be a going concern entity that is the business would continue unless for example the business ceases to exist or the entity does not have an alternative but to liquidate 
right? I think I think we would be able to assess this better. We would be able to relate this better to the to the COVID instance, for example, right? You may have come across instances. You may have read about that. There are few airlines businesses. You know, they actually went under liquidation during the COVID time. Okay, in, in 2020, for example, it all happened. I mean, so what are we saying is that they did not really liquidate on the last date, wherein, of course, we are talking about the financial statements we prepared, right? They, they of course, got liquidated a bit later. But on the reporting date, on the last day, the management needs to make an assessment whether the entity would be able to continue or there is a significant issue with that assumption. Okay, and that is where the management and auditors need to assess that very, very candidly that whether this going concern assumption is a valid assumption or not. Okay, so what are we saying is that if there is a valid assumption about going concern, then absolutely, absolutely perfect. But you need to disclose in case there are significant uncertainties regarding the ability to continue and in case, for example, the financial statements are not prepared on going concern, then you need to quantify, you need to assess in terms of what is the reason for not preparing these financial statements on a going concern basis, right? If I really take you back on the same example I was trying to refer to, that when you look at uh, an airline sector, it is it is very much a cost heavy sector. It's a lot of, lot of borrowings of, uh, you know, uh, external borrowings are used to, to run the operations and the margins are very thin. So when this COVID happened, practically the, the, the entire aviation sector got, you know, uh, went into a halt, right? But there were still payments to be made for the aircraft that took on these. There were still payments to be made for the interest that you took from, uh, on the loan that you took from the banks, for example. There was still operational cost to be incurred, but then there was no, there was no, uh, you know, uh, recovery of money because you're not selling anything, right? So if you are sitting on the reporting date when a balance sheet or, or the set of financial statements have to be finalized, but you don't see any, any possibility of doing the business in future, even for a, you know, medium term. Of course, we are talking about something like a six months tenure, at least when, when COVID practically started. Obviously, it went beyond six months for many countries. So, so effectively, we are talking about does the management strongly believe, right? Does the management strongly believe that they would be able to sail through that tough time? Okay. If not, then you need to disclose that part. Okay. And, and that is where sometimes we can, we can actually argue, won't the management be simply saying that, no, we will continue. So even auditors need to question that judgment. And that's something which you need to look at whether this assumption is appropriate or not. And it's a very, very, very significant assumption that we are talking about, right? So, so quickly, just to revisit this section, we are saying that there's a need for, of course, uh, the conceptual framework. It talks about the objective, qualitative attributes, assumptions, elements of financial statements and their measurement. This is something which is a summary of this entire section. The users could be multiple. The objectives are to talk about, of course, People should be able to take, you know, the, the economic decisions, the investment decisions, the user should be able to do that, right? So that is something which is, is more detailed talked about under NDS 1. That's the first standard that we'll be doing after discussion of the framework. And of course, the underlying assumptions of accrual as well as the going concern are important for us to consider. All right. The next section, now it, it seems a little, little conceptual, little theoretical and, and, and well, it is a bit theoretical, of course, but then we talk about the qualitative characteristics. We won't be spending a lot of time talking about that, but this is one slide which you'd be very, very comfortable knowing, right? We talk about understandability, relevance, which includes in itself materiality. We talk about reliability and the comparability act. Within the reliability perspective, we talk about faithful presentation, substance over form, prudence, completeness, neutrality, and, and all these aspects involved, right? Now, when I say I'm preparing a set of financial statements, somebody is going to use that, somebody is going to look at it and take a decision about that company, whether they should be continuing with their investments or should they be you know, pulling out their money back. So, so these financial statements need to follow you know, some benchmarking, some kind of qualitative attributes so that 
users are not you know feeling like users are not being you know made appear like they're they they are made they are made fool out of it right so this it has to meet those norms well right there's no there's no stricter a watertight compartment that this is the way it should rigorously be but it should be a bit more flexible when you talk about understandability or relevance or reliability or even a comparability you talk about something which is logical which is which is sensible in terms of representation right so those attributes have to be followed by the entities you know uh, and and the auditors need to ensure that these attributes are being addressed in the right context so when i say i'm talking about understandability we talked about that example where i say that if there is a there is a doctor or an engineer who's going to look at the financial statements unlikely he knows anything about accounting so we are simply saying that the the very basic thought process that 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 the financial statements carry that anybody who's going to be looking at these financial statements they are they are assumed to have a reasonable knowledge of the business right they should be knowing what the business is all about and according the financial statement should be precise without getting into too much of complexities not a use of too much of a jargon or a detailed explanation of something unless unless required under the india's framework okay let's take a small example around it it says that simply if you talk about an oil and gas company which is which is in itself is a complex business right which is conducting for example exploration services they would talk about it you know what that industry is all about so there are going to be some terminologies there are going to be some terminologies which relate to that business okay me as an accountant who has never probably for example worked on or in 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 oil oil and gas sector may not be able to appreciate that right so even if i'm an accountant i don't get it right so when i'm preparing or when i'm looking at the financial statements of that business i need to have a reasonable knowledge of the operations of the business right that's something which is the expectation that the users of the financial statement would know about the exploration activities and there is no need to explain these basic terminologies which are used in that business candidly but in case there are specific terms which are changing then they should be specifically explained and and how is the presentation aspect how is the you know the the measurement aspect when i say measurement I, i mean to say accounting for that that should be explained in case there is a deviation from the from the normal scenario there okay relevance is again in lines with what we would know in the general meaning we simply say that don't give anything which is irrelevant it does not serve the purpose right that need to be relevant and probably relevant and materiality they need to be looked in look from the same same you know uh, same horizon right so we simply say that something which would be relevant that can impact the economic decision of the users right so so we are talking about materiality as a, as a context of relevance only let's take a very small example around it it says that a default by a customer who owes 1000 rupees to a company with an asset worth of 1 crore rupees of course is irrelevant you don't have to really go in detail but maybe a default of let's say 20 lakh rupees really becomes a critical relevant information okay similarly if there is a you know instance like a, a, a major fire taking place after the end of the reporting date right but before the issuance of the financial statement as a process now this could be a relevant information again right you don't want to make the user wait until the next year or the next accounting period to explain or give the details of this so called as a major fire there so so you need to be a bit more clearer about it you need to be careful judging what is relevant and what is not relevant so materiality of course is said that it goes in line i think that's something which is being referred to that information would be material if for example omitting that or misstating that or not allowing it to be shown right obscuring that could reasonably be expected to influence the decision right so we are going a little more broader where we say that even if there is a belief that it can influence you know somebody's decision making then you need to take care of that you can't just ignore that information for example right if i say let's give a scenario a has an inventory of 1 lakh rupees for example and then there are spare parts finished goods working clothes and tools 
the materiality limit has been assessed at 30,000 rupees based on the management estimation. How should the presentation be done under the materiality criteria? Now, simply put, if I say my, my materiality limit is 30,000 rupees and, and there are different components within, for example, let's say, you know, uh, the inventory, it is, it is desirable, it is appropriate to show any items separately which are meeting that materiality benchmark and and if i were to look at let's say the remaining part if they are if they are similar then it's it's appropriate to club them to right so in this case for example i might be wiser to say my spare parts to the extent of 30 so let's bring that as a separate category my work in progress which is 40 and my finished goods and tools, for example, which is 25 plus five, which is 30, it would be appropriate to use, you know, the aggregation for these two items because they together don't breach the, you know, uh, the individually don't, don't really breach the material levels. The thresholds are within the material perspective. So that's how you start looking at you know, building that, right? So just, just to kind of highlight, this, this is something which is given in a in a more structured manner. We say that A has estimated the material level of 30,000 rupees, which suggests that everything which is more than this amount, it is desirable, it is required for that matter to show it separately so that users are aware of it. You know, anything above 30,000 rupees is clearly visible, it's separately known, right? Subject to the nature of, for example, the inventories, Therefore, the inventories would be on the face of the balance sheet, you would still show one lakh rupees, but as a part of disclosures in terms of the, the, the split of inventory, you can actually show the working progress is 40,000 rupees, spare parts, for example, so raw material as 30,000 rupees, and the finished goods and tools combined at, let's say, 30,000 rupees here, right? Since the WIP and the spare parts are, you know, separate items within the, within the threshold limit, or along with this threshold limit, that's why they are being shown separately. But the finished goods and tools, of course, are combined together. Okay. Now, this one could be about the reliability. It simply means, you know, if in case the information is relevant, but it's not reliable, of course, it does not again serve the purpose, which means that you have to give, give an information which is which is an objective information. You cannot give an information which is which is biased or has a subjectivity element, right? In a very in a very simple scenario, I would I would want to put it like this. Let's say there is a there is a company X Y, right? It's a simple example that we that we have read about and we can talk about it here. There's a company X Y who has a director A, right? So the company advances. 20 crore rupees to director A, which is okay. So there's nothing illegal about it that could be allowed. Right? But then this advance is shown as a part of an other advance. So let's say there could be a total advance is given of 25 or 25 crores, for example, to employees, right? Of course, in, in the context of a director, even he's an employee. So, so this 25 crores to an employee, as, as, as an example, so let's say 20 to the director and five crores to other set of employees, there's nothing wrong in this information, but this is not an objective information. Also. I mean, after all, director A is, is somebody who has the ability to influence the operation. So if he's taking 24, 20 crore rupees, I'm not saying there is illegal to do that, but the shareholders would need to know about that out of this 25, 20 has been given to A, right? This is this is a biased information if this entire 25 is covered under, let's say, the advanced to, to, advance to employees, because people would not get to know about it, right? It's a misleading information, and that's why it would require a separate disclosure, right? So let's take another example around it. It says that, a legal case has been filed against A Limited. However, expected amount at the year end cannot be evaluated. What would be the relevant information and what would be reliable in that? Now, importantly, 
if the expected outcome cannot be evaluated, you still need to give a disclosure. You still need to tell what are the possible financial implications of that. Right? That's something which you talk about the reliability perspective, right? It would not be appropriate at the same time to recognize the full amount of the claim, but at least a disclosure around that is, is going to be critical, right? We'll see these kind of instances, by the way. So this is something which is covered through related party, right? This is something which is covered through provisions, for example. So there are there are different standards which which support. So 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 the very basis of those standards is coming through these qualitative attributes as well. So you start start connecting with that the framework's requirement in this case, right? Faithful representation again. I think the idea is to basically ensure that you know uh, when you when you look at when you look at any of the elements when you look at any any asset or liability or income etc. You know you're ensuring that there is a there is a clear faithful representation done of those right. You cannot just make a recognition of something without without merit right. That's something which is the idea. Let's have a look at for example in this case we say that any revenue which you want to recognize, but amount cannot be known, right? Then you are simply, you know, kind of projecting something which is which is not appropriate. It's it's unfaithful representation from the from the presentation and the measurement perspective. You know, as an example for for that matter, right? Similarly, if there is, for example, a recoverability of debtor which which is remote, then 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 showing that entire receivable in the books without provisioning is again not a faithful presentation, right? Very very basic examples, very fundamental examples. But importantly, these aspects are well covered through different indas also, right? If I say revenue, I'm probably referring to something like indas one one five. We'll study that in detail separately. The moment I say the provisioning part of it. It is covered through India's 109, which is financial instruments, for example. Okay. Substance over form, very, very candidly. We hear this term so often, right? In in, in the entire journey of accounting so far. We we do talk about substance over form. And the, and the classic example is leasing arrangement, right? So even if I say it's a lease, which means that I don't own the asset. In substance, I'm I'm, I'm controlling the asset. And that's where we start talking about that whatever is the you know the, the the substance or the economic reality whatever is the the basis or the reasoning of a transition taking place that should be used for accounting purposes not the legal form okay on paper the contracts may say something but you need to talk about the intent you need to talk about the underlying reality of that concept there right so for example if i say an asset has been sold from A limited to Mr. X, and immediately after the transition, X has leased out the same to A limited, right? So in a way, A is showing a sale, and then A is also showing a lease back, right? Now, in essence, this asset never went out of A's balance sheet, you know, and, and that that's what we are trying to kind of you know highlight. So this is essentially a leasing or a sale and lease back concept that is something which is covered through in days 116 but where i'm trying to come to is that when you look at the word substance over form we try to bring that intent in reality although although let's say as a transaction yes the sale happened there's no denial about that right and the lease back also happened again that's not a problem so in a way there are two transactions but the essence of this transaction, essence of these transactions is suggesting that the asset was always there with A. Even though he sold it, it actually came back almost instantly back to A, rather than as an owner in form of a leasehold, leasehold asset. Right. So essentially, what accounting expects us to do is to look at the spirit of the transaction. And accordingly, you know, you cannot be allowed to recognize a sale either right so practically the sale would not be you know shown in the books and the asset would remain would continue to remain in the books of a and the transactions need to be accounted for accordingly okay right neutrality is simply about you know making uh, you know uh, uh, 
a clear information there should not be any subjectivity it should be a neutral information for example the whole idea is that the financial statements are not considered to be neutral either in the selection of the presentation of information if they for example can influence the decision making of the users right a very slight example around it says the com a company is facing litigation although reasonable estimate of the amount of possible settlement could be made the management decide to disclose its inability to measure the potential liability now subjectivity comes you cannot be allowed to just take it like that right it's important that you need to disclose it appropriately otherwise the neutrality objective has gone you know, practically it is not getting met there okay prudence will see a lot of lot of instances of prudence around it prudence simply says if you are seeing a loss which is unavoidable okay to simply book that loss right we have heard this term so many times the conservatism principle of the prudence concept it says that if there is a future loss which is unavoidable right if you are obliged to incur that loss is there a present obligation to incur that loss please do make a provision you cannot overstate your performance you cannot overstate your position either an asset for example if i say i have a car which i purchased for 10 lakh rupees but it met an accident for example and i can only recover 2 lakh rupees out of that you cannot show this car for 10 lakh rupees anymore you will only be allowed to show it for 2 lakh rupees importantly prudent does not mean you can show whatever losses that you want again it's a, it's, it's a prohibited way to look at it right i mean you can't just book any loss that you don't anticipate to incur right you need to be careful about that assessment also okay a small example the savables recoveries are based on some estimates etc and prudent approach would be would need to be followed to be ensuring that you know your your clear assessment of that provision is being done you cannot just give a generic provision you have to really measure it you know keeping in view all the all the practical aspects there right finally on the completeness part of it we simply say that the transactions should be completed right you cannot have anything which is left midway right it would be it would be for example for any instances if you cannot if you're not putting every transition which has taken place you know you would you would you would know and and that's something that you study in in the audit section as well the cutoff dates right so so those aspects have to be understood if there is something which has to be recognized because the transaction has taken place just before the date of reporting, then you have to bring that into the accounting. You cannot just leave it midway, right? So those recognition principles, et cetera, have a role to play as well, right? Similarly, when you look at a brief example, let's say there could be some costs which are becoming a part of your you know, operational expenses. So, so there could be something which is a direct cost above the gross profit, but you're booking it below the gross profit. That would simply overstate the gross margin. Then it should be ensured that it is it is appropriately at the right place and and, and, and shown completely. You know, it's covered completely in the in, in all regards from, from that perspective, right? Comparability, well, we'll we'll deal with this part more in India one specifically. But what it says is basically that if you are preparing the financial statements, then your financial statements for this year, right, should be comparable to your financial statements of the last year, as well as those of the competition. Okay, so in a way you need to follow a structured format you cannot just keep on playing around the, the the presentation side of it you cannot for example be allowed to use different accounting policies in different years right because the comparability would be affected right the comparability is very much required because people would like to make an assessment of how it has been going how it's a trend for example right and that's the reason why the comparability and the standardization of the presentation and the accounting policies has to be ensured by the entities there. Okay. Very small example around it says that some expenses which were earlier shown under cost of sales, but now you want to show as other general expenses is not an appropriate presentation. So you need to be carefully bringing that. Otherwise, your auditors can always qualify these statements if these are material, of course, right? So from that perspective, you need to understand that. 
even if these are not material you're not allowed to do you know an incorrect accounting that's something that you want to take care of okay finally when you look at you know uh, ensuring let's say you know uh, uh, bringing the relevant and reliable information the the bigger challenge that you would see that it has to be the financial statements to be prepared on a timely basis so there is an inherent risk involved right while i'm using an audit language but there is a risk involved that because the timeline is there not everything would be covered right similarly it could be too costly to do everything to to make it make it you know in, in make it presentable in the right the relevant and reliable information and of course you have to really balance between all these attributes right of completeness of of reliability of faithful presentation of you know comparability etc you need to bring them all in the in the right perspective right a small section that we talked about of course you look at all these aspects of understandability relevance reliability comparability i think from an examination standpoint if you if you if you can list those correctly and and you are able to explain them a bit if the examination asks you that could be a good section that could be a good learning out of this entire section there all right thank you very much